Hello everyone, this is Foodies a Conversation Alumni Edition, session 66. We are introducing our uh, alumni, our ecosystem member who attended any of the educational programs Future Food organized so far, let it be uh, any of the summer schools or um, the Food Innovation Master program. Hacker boot camps will be organized together with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, these are very casual conversations, 20 to 30 minutes. Hi, Marco. Hello. How, How are, are you? you? Good, good. I just quickly do the intro so that everyone understands the context. Why are we actually online together? Um, so it will be a casual conversation where you can get to know Marco in this case and uh, his um, local food system, how he joined the F future food ecosystem. And um, yeah, it will be just inspiring and, um, and uh, we will address some food system issues. I um, know that you might not be able to stay with us the entire time, but don't worry because it will be posted on our IGTV afterwards and we also have a dedicated um, YouTube channel playlist where you can watch uh, along with Marco's um, uh, session also 65 other stories of um, other um, alumni uh, from the Future Food Institute. So now, without me taking too much time, I encourage everyone, please, to feel free um, and post questions in the chat. We will try to accommodate them as well. Um, and now I would like to ask Marco to please introduce yourself. Tell us where you are dialing in from and how did you end up on the digital bootcamp last November? Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Julia. I'm uh, Marco and I'm calling from Brussels, where I'm currently located. Um, I joined the family of the Future Food Institute due to a necessity. I was trying to find uh, a group of people that could inspire me to approach the uh, world of the global food chain system and the problematics uh, that goes with it. So I have studied, uh, I'm at my second master degree, at the, I'm writing the thesis right now. The first one was Globalization and Development in Spain. And the second one is African studies in Copenhagen. And in both uh, master degrees, the, one of the main problematics uh, was the, uh, exactly how do we manage uh, the uh, global food chain? How do we manage the fact that uh, 700 million people are actually without the necessary meaning to survive? And uh, three times that number are people with, uh, that are affected of obesity and uh, a lot of uh, million of uh, pounds of food are wasted every year. So I was online as usual because after the COVID, uh, I spent my life on my computer, unfortunately. But luckily, I saw the profile of, Sa of Sara Roversi, uh, which is the leading figure, I would say, of the Future Food Institute. And she is my, she's like a, a goddess to, to, I think, all the people that joined the, actually the boot camp because they're just only her energy drives all towards a common goal. So I found her and then I found uh, the Future Food Institute website. And I think I spent two hours on the website until I found the digital bootcamp. And I was really surprised by both the, how the, the challenge is uh, built, all the organization there is behind and all the different kind of people that wants to join these network so I applied and you granted me actually a scholarship so it was very very nice and it started like that and I joined with a friend Maria exactly. that, I, that I brought with me actually. Exactly Maria was also featured on the on this session so everyone you can check out her conversation which was I think around one and a half weeks ago. Um, so um, if you could tell the audience what exactly this digital bootcamp was for you? What were the main learnings? What were the, the exercises or maybe the topics what, you know, um, uh, triggered you more? And what can you apply now in, in your future, in the next steps, what you are taking towards more sustainable food system? Very, very gladly. Um, but first of all, to describe the digital bootcamp, I would say that it's a month of your life where you completely immerse yourself in a, an experience that uh, can, dif uh, can be different because obviously there's four tracks, uh, which can be climate smart uh, uh, farms, Cities. city, ocean and uh, exactly. everything that, uh, that we talked about. 
And so there's a, a huge number of people that choose which tracks and not all, all the tracks can be done at the same time or you can choose only one. So I was in climate smart agriculture and obviously my uh, path at the, in the Future Food Institute, Digital Food Camp, uh, followed that, uh, those issues. Uh, for example, there was a live session with a company called Vegitech that for me was absolutely uh, amazing because they are doing what I would like to see in the future. So using technology to, to give solu real solution to people. And uh, they have established a huge network of indoor uh, farming and, and they are uh, go, uh, working in various parts of the world, for example, as well, uh, South Africa, recently we just moved there. And for me, their passion and how they set up the company was incredible. And that's just one of the lectures that I went through. So um, we started with uh, just master classes and uh, to each layer, every time you, we, I don't know, we did a le lecture about uh, ecosystemic thinking with Xavi. And that was associated to an exercise that was either to do alone at home or in a breakout room with other people. So the, the actual challenge was to enhance my personal skills. Meanwhile, I was creating a, a relationship with other people that I didn't know previously. And I was in my apartment in Brussels talking with at the end during the hackathon, for example, with uh, Greg uh, that uh, was living in Bologna, but he usually lives in Singapore and Gaston that is Brazilian. And I actually created a really good relationship with them and it's been super, super interesting. And as well with the mentors and the people that uh, gave the master classes. So I had uh, the opportunity to, to talk with Christian uh, Richmond and Z, which is the founder and CEO of Migrants. And that was uh, really important to me to see a person that works for five years um, as a senior commissioner for Frontex and that leaves everything to become CEO of his own project. Uh, that's absolutely inspiring. And I would say that the best thing that I take home about the whole digital bootcamp, about the whole program is the fact that uh, uh, during the last five years in university, my, during my ac academic path, uh, a lot of professors and a lot of people that I, I'm really proud to, to know now uh, concentrating their effort on the be critical, critical about something and uh, find where the problem lays, which is very important. But the digital putcam gave me this new perspective. You have to be critical that you need to be creative as well, because if, if you're not creative, your solutions will be likely to resemble some problematics that are already in the problem. So that's what I, I think I, I take uh, with me now in my everyday life. That's an amazing summary. Thank you so much. No um, so yes, what uh, you mentioned with the, um, the different tracks, we also decided because I, we felt um, that limiting people only to follow one track or two, uh, might, they might miss out on some, um, um, some information, but are coming in, in a class which is about oceans, but at the end of the day, it's a researcher who turned into an entrepreneur and can give you some tools that are uh, applicable for everyone. So from now on, all of the tracks are open for all participants. And uh, what is very important that um, it is a four-week uh, part-time program, but you stay part of a community. So as you can see, I'm having a conversation with Marco now, but uh, we also have um, may maybe job opportunities, maybe collaboration options, maybe events what we want to share with you. So we try to keep the climate shapers and also uh, part of the actively part of the, the community. But you will see that along the, the other conversations as well. So, but back to Marco now. Uh, I would like to hear a bit uh, about the project um, Serve the City, where you were acting as a volunteer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how do you see that uh, project? Um, what is the role of this project in, in its own local community? And what was your role in, in um, the organization? So uh, meanwhile, I was I, I arrived in Brussels and uh, suddenly after one month, basically all the hospitality activity closed due to restriction for COVID. Uh, and that's why I, I had to find something else to do rather than work uh, in a bar as I usually do while studying or looking for an internship. And 
uh, Service City was one of the projects that I liked the most because um, it gave me the possibility to stay outside, to connect with people, but also to see what it really happens in a city like Brussels. Uh, therefore, Service City uh, is a group of people that voluntarily organize to serve breakfast to migrants and people without uh, uh, homeless people, I would say, in Brussels. But uh, mostly people coming from uh, North Africa, Central Africa. And that was really interesting to me because obviously coming from African studies in Copenhagen, I had the chance to talk with some of the, these guys meanwhile I was serving them. And uh, basically, my 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 days uh, went. Uh, it was something that really enriched my days because I just woke up. I could have stayed home because there's actually really nothing to do in Brussels right now apart from running. If you want to run, and that gave me a possibility to bike uh, right there, set up tables, set up the coffee, wait for uh, all the people that are uh, waiting for the coffee to line up and then serve everybody for one hour and two and then stay with them one hour, hour and speak with them. So I think it's a really well-organized uh, service, which is not the only one, is uh, one of the services that the city provides to people in need. But I think that was uh, a really nice experience. Amazing. So do you have by any chance numbers? How many people are we talking about what this organization can actually feed on a regular basis? The community on both the people who serve and the people that are served is huge. Because, for example, on the WhatsApp group uh, of Service City, there is like hundreds of people, maybe 100, 150. And the people that you serve during the... Days, it depends from days because obviously on Monday there's not as many people as on Saturday, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can have up to 100, 200 people waiting in line. And if there's less people, you get to know more because people get the coffee twice or three times. So <laughs> at the third time, you actually maybe remember the name. But uh, there's been very busy days where the line is really long and you see that it's in Brussels, the weather is really humid, and uh, therefore, even if you co cover up, it's not really easy to feel warm. That's why those days you have to speed up because there's many people suffering uh, of yeah, cold. Yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. So you are also part of an other organization. I, I think I can yes, call it this Brussels, way, and no I will sense. try to uh, say the name properly. Um, Giovanni Europeisti Verdi, okay. Uh, would you mind telling us what this organization is doing and uh, what are, is your mission and what, what are you doing with them? Absolutely. Uh, uh, as the service city, the uh, digital bootcamp, uh, this is uh, an action that they do voluntarily because of my will to amplify my network, the people that I know, and uh, to focus on what it really matters to me. So in Brussels, uh, we can say that uh, I rejoined the European bubble. And it's something that coming from African studies uh, is not really easy to accept for me because I had to fight and deconstruct a lot of my identity during these years. But once I came back, uh, I had to make a choice. So looking for an internship, uh, being active in my community, uh, what interests to me for real is the obviously climate change adaptability that in the, the processes that we will need to intercur in the next years and advocacy pr processes and the effort that people do in these uh, concerns. So I firstly joined uh, uh, the European Green Party in Italy, Europa Verde, which uh, has uh, is on regional basis. So for example, I joined the WhatsApp group of the Europa Verde of Milan. And inside this uh, is like the same of the European party, but uh, uh, in Italy, unfortunately, we don't have the same appeal. So I, I actually um, really care about this, uh, this issue because I think that there's few people in this moment, even in the new government that we have that are taking, they're putting, uh, they're, they're facing one, one big issue and they're trying to say, okay, this is the time we have, this is the tools we have, and that's the money you should allocate for uh, a concrete response. 
and uh, so I don't really like to be into involved into politics as such that much. So I found this uh, grassroots movement that is just composed by young people, by youth, and is voluntarily uh, joined, as uh, as I said before. And uh, is the there is one also in Europe. It's called the uh, Young Federation of Green uh, Young Greens. And um, basically, we organize uh, stuff. We talk about, uh, for example, we talk for one month uh, about uh, hemp, uh, how the new business uh, should be treated and should be looked upon from different perspectives. So medicine, uh, uh, like on Saturday, we will be a chef uh, all alive with the Jev uh, cooking Felice Arletti using hemp. Uh, but there's many, many, many issues like the new common agricultural policy. We make a, I mean, I just joined, so it's few months that I'm in and I just uh, uh, try to give my contribution. But there's people that are involved since years and they are doing campaigns. The other day I joined here in Brussels, uh, the climate strike uh, on Friday and we set up, I mean, I, I joined and I look setting up a clock with uh, the earth and the uh, uh, countdown, uh, like seven, six years, na na na. And that was in front of the European Commission. And, and there was a green European MEP uh, giving a little speech, and then it was just people of my age. So I think that this is the, uh, I'm really proud actually to, to talk for them because it's people who really understood that we don't have a lot of time and through their studies and their background, which might vary it a lot, they have one common goal and we are uh, teaming up, we can say, to face it. Amazing. So um, it was a great example of it, the clock and also the positioning. What I wanted to ask, um, I think it's very important to, to gather like-minded people who want to take action into, into organized groups and share knowledge with them and so on. Uh, how do you see that um, policymaking can hear the voices of these organizations? It's a really great question and uh, how policymakers, I would say, can hear. It's not easy to, at the moment, I think, to um, create the space for people like us with a, with a common goal to shape policymaking. But I think that the role of technology will lead uh, this effort because uh, the more we organize each other, the more we um campaign the more we are appealing to people that maybe are not listening they are not pressuring their governments because it's not as easy as saying oh yes we want human rights for all you know uh, there's issues that has to be tackled from more um, conscious perspective but uh, I understand that not in everybody's life there is time to think about uh, environmental justice, for example. So what we should do and what I think that uh, also the Future Food Institute uh, is doing very well is to catalyze, we can say, these people, take their ideas, uh, give them the right uh, places, even like during the digital bootcamp, having a breakout rooms after one hour class with three people that are, one in India, one is in Italy, one is in Brussels, and one is in Rio de Janeiro, and debate about these issues is actually the first step, I think, towards a, a common dialogue that could shape policy making. Uh, obviously, it has to shift from the breakout rooms on Zoom from the Future for Institute to maybe a, a ministerial meeting or an auditing in the, in the parliament, uh, either uh, regionally or, or um, in Italy, in the various states. But I think that uh, we are uh, starting a way that could lead us to be there in a few, few years, I would say. Definitely. You know, I, I like this way of thinking, wherein from these platforms you move into those um, um, policy-making environments. However, what I wish for myself, especially someone who is running these boot camps, if some policymakers would join the yes, boot camps. Absolutely. Because I think those conversations, it's a safe environment to share your thoughts and also to explain. So I think um, this is a call for action now.
I am calling for policymakers to join the next boot camp in June. <laughs> Absolutely, and I support the claim uh, with all my heart because it would be honestly the more people uh, are behind these kind of dialogues because the dialogue. Uh, I, I really want to say that who wants to do the digital bootcamp has to be obviously challenged by the fact that he's going to share and uh, will participate into a discussion with people that are very brilliant, that are very uh, informed and that are striving to do something concrete, concrete for the environment and for uh, the uh, food global chain. But uh, at the same time, it, as you said, it's a safe environment you can uh, express some thoughts that are not maybe uh, uh, as good as what other people could say about a, a certain issue, but that's exactly the point. The next time you're going to do that in front of the people that you can actually influence, you're going to do it in another way. And that's the, where the, the little exactly. trick is, I would say. Yeah, and also to hear each other's perspectives because there might be different opinions, but they are not necessarily right or wrong. It's just that you are coming from a different context and you have a different perspective of looking at the certain, um, certain issue. Um, so we are approaching the end of our conversation and I think we have already very ambitious goals. I, I like it. Um, um, I would like to understand how do you see your preferred food future? And here I allow everyone to think out of the box, be completely utopistic if you want, or stay more realistic and, and understand what are the boundaries, what we have at the moment or challenges, what we have to face. Uh, but I would like to hear about Marco's preferred food future. Okay, so very briefly, I would like to see uh, the technology we use today to post uh, a selfie on Instagram or uh, we have our smartphones that are taking 90% of the activities we do either towards working, eating, whatever. Uh, I want that to be translated into um, a smart way to to control how much you eat, how much you waste, and how nutritious the food is. So I think that the next uh, food revolution will be uh, indoor uh, farming and uh, plant-based uh, products. So uh, if you want to have a sustainable future, you have to invest, 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 and at the same time that you are um, building projects, that you are making people uh creating actually implementing their own ideas the same people have to be accountable for the youth that is uh, growing up so there has to be every project we do has to be explained through uh, seminars through little classes through gamification to young people because whatever we do now we do it because we want to strive and nobody apart from little niche realities has been informed enough to face the challenges we have today. But my nieces, for example, that are uh, six and 11 years old can be trained to be way better than me and have such a creative mind uh, that I, I can't tell in this moment because I didn't receive a proper education. I can do my part, but uh, as the founder of Vegitech, did Vegit, uh, created Vegitech, I will do something. But my niece is if uh, uh, my knowledge will be shared uh, in the proper way, will do even better. So I think that's uh, the way. Sounds very good. Thank you so much for sharing with thank us. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Marco, thank you for the, the inspiring conversation. And uh, for those who joined us a bit late, the um, conversation will be posted immediately on IGTV, so you will be able to listen to the beginning. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you got completely interested in the whole conversation now that you heard our last sentences. Uh, and also, uh, it will be posted tomorrow on our YouTube channel, where you will also find the other conversations we hosted so far. And then please t uh, stay tuned, because the next one is next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Central European time. Uh, where we will feature the next alumni. Marco, thank you so much uh, and you we will so be in much. touch. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good day.